Painting as a Pastime, Part 1, by the Right Honorable Winston Churchill. I do not submit these sketches to the public gaze because I am under any illusion about their merit. They are the productions of a weekend and holiday amateur who during the last few years has found a new pleasure and who wishes to tell others of his luck. To have reached the age of 40 without ever handling a brush or fiddling with a pencil, to have regarded with mature eye the painting of pictures of any kind as a mystery, to have stood agape before the chalk of the pavement artist, and then suddenly to find oneself plunged in the middle of a new and intense form of interest and action with paints and palettes and canvases, and not to be discouraged by results, is an astonishing and enriching experience. I hope it may be shared by others. I should be glad if these lines, I should be proud if these sketches, induced others to try the experiment which I have tried, and if some, at least, were to find themselves dowered with an absorbing new amusement delightful to themselves, and at any rate not violently harmful to man or beast. I hope this is modest enough, because there is no subject on which I feel more humble, or yet at the same time more natural. I do not presume to explain how to paint, but only how to get enjoyment. Do not turn the superior eye of critical passivity upon these efforts. Buy a paint box and have a try. If you need something to occupy your leisure, to divert your mind from the daily round, to illuminate your holidays, do not be too ready to believe that you cannot find what you want here. Even at the advanced age of forty, it would be a sad pity to shuffle or scramble along through one's playtime with golf and bridge, pottering, loitering, shifting from one heel to the other, wondering what on earth to do, as perhaps is the fate of some unhappy beings, when all the while, if you only knew, there is close at hand a wonderful new world of thought and craft, a sunlit garden gleaming with light and color of which you have the key in your waistcoat pocket, inexpensive independence, a mobile and perennial pleasure apparatus, new mental food and exercise, the old harmonies and symmetries in an entirely different language, an added interest to every common scene, an occupation for every idle hour, an unceasing voyage of entrancing discovery. These are high prizes. Make quite sure they are not yours. After all, if you try and fail, there is not much harm done. The nursery will grab what the studio has rejected. And then you can always go out and kill some animal, humiliate some rival on the links, or despoil some friend across the green table. You really will not be worse off in any way. In fact, you will be better off. You will know beyond a peradventure, to quote a phrase disagreeably reminiscent, that that is really what you are meant to do in your hours of relaxation. But if, on the contrary, you are inclined, late in life though it be, to reconnoiter a foreign sphere of limitless extent, then be persuaded that the first quality that is needed is audacity. There really is no time for the deliberate approach. Two years of drawing lessons, three years of copying woodcuts, five years of plaster casts. These are for the young. They have enough to bear. And this thorough grounding is for those who, hearing the call in the morning of their days, are able to make painting their paramount lifelong vocation. The truth and beauty of line and form, which by the slightest touch or twist of the brush, a real artist imparts to every feature of his design must be founded on long, hard, persevering apprenticeship, 
and a practice so habitual that it has become instinctive. We must not be too ambitious. We cannot aspire to masterpieces. We may content ourselves with a joyride in a paint box, and for this audacity is the only ticket. I shall now relate my personal experience. When I left the Admiralty at the end of May 1915, I still remained a member of the Cabinet and of the War Council. In this position, I knew everything and could do nothing. The change from the intense executive activities of each day's work at the Admiralty to the narrowly measured duties of a councillor left me gasping, like a sea beast fished up from the depths or a diver too suddenly hoisted, my veins threatened to burst from the fall in pressure. I had great anxiety and no means of relieving it. I had vehement convictions and small power to give effect to them. I had long hours of utterly unwanted leisure in which to contemplate the unfolding of the war. And then it was that the muse of painting came to my rescue, out of charity and out of chivalry, because, after all, she had nothing to do with me, and said, Are these toys any good to you? They amuse some people. Having bought a paint box, an easel, and a canvas, the next step was to begin. But what a step to take! The palette gleamed with beads of color. Fair and white rose the canvas. The empty brush hung poised, heavy with destiny, irresolute in the air. My hand seemed arrested by a silent veto. But, after all, the sky on this occasion was unquestionably blue, and a pale blue at that. There could be no doubt that blue paint mixed with white should be put on the top part of the canvas. One really does not need to have had an artist's training to see that. It is a starting point open to all. So, very gingerly, I mixed a little blue paint on the palette with a very small brush, and then with infinite precaution made a mark about as big as a bean upon the affronted snow-white shield. It was a challenge, a deliberate challenge, but so subdued, so halting, indeed so cataleptic, that it deserved no response. At that moment, the loud approaching sound of a motor car was heard in the drive. From this chariot there stepped swiftly and lightly, none other than the gifted wife of Sir John Lavery. Painting! But what are you hesitating about? Let me have a brush, the big one. Splash into the turpentine, wallop into the blue and white, frantic flourish on the palette, clean no longer, and then several large, fierce strokes and slashes of blue on the absolutely cowering canvas. Anyone could see that it could not hit back. No evil fate avenged the jaunty violence. The canvas grinned in helplessness before me. The spell was broken. The sickly inhibitions rolled away. I seized the largest brush and fell upon my victim with berserk fury. I have never felt any awe of a canvas since. Everyone knows the feelings with which one stands, shivering on a springboard, and the shock when a friendly foe steals up behind and hurls you into the flood, and the ardent glow which thrills you as you emerge breathless from the plunge. This beginning with audacity, or being thrown into the middle of it, is already a very great part of the art of painting but there is more in it than that. La peinture à l'huile est bien difficile, mais c'est beaucoup plus beau que la peinture à l'huile. I write no word in disparagement of watercolors, but there really is nothing like oils. 
you have a medium at your disposal which offers real power if you only can find out how to use it moreover it is easier to get a certain distance along the road by its means than by water color first of all you can correct mistakes much more easily one sweep of the palette knife lifts the blood and tears of a morning from the canvas and enables a fresh start to be made secondly you can approach your problem from any direction you need not build downwards awkwardly from white paper to your darkest dark you may strike where you please beginning if you will with a moderate central arrangement of middle tones and then hurling in the extremes when the psychological moment comes lastly the pigment itself is such nice stuff to handle if it does not retaliate you can build it on layer after layer if you like you can keep on experimenting you can change your plan to meet the exigencies of time or weather and always remember you can scrape it all away just to paint is great fun the colors are lovely to look at and delicious to squeeze out matching them however crudely with what you see is fascinating and absolutely absorbing try it if you have not done so before you die as one slowly begins to escape from the difficulties of choosing the right colors and laying them on in the right places and in the right way wider considerations come into view one begins to see for instance that painting a picture is like fighting a battle and trying to paint a picture is i suppose like trying to fight a battle it is if anything more exciting than fighting it successfully but the principle is the same it is the same kind of problem as unfolding a long sustained interlocked argument it is a proposition which whether of few or numberless parts is commanded by a single unity of conception and we think though i cannot tell that painting a great picture must require an intellect on the grand scale there must be that all-embracing view which presents the beginning and the end the whole and each part as one instantaneous impression retentively and untiringly held in the mind when we look at the larger turners canvases yards wide and tall and observe that they are all done in one piece and represent one single second of time and that every innumerable detail however small however distant however subordinate is set forth naturally and in its true proportion and relation without effort without failure we must feel in presence of an intellectual manifestation the equal in quality and intensity of the finest achievements of warlike action of forensic argument or of scientific or philosophical adjudication in all battles two things are usually required of the commander-in-chief to make a good plan for his army and secondly to keep a strong reserve both these are also obligatory upon the painter to make a plan thorough reconnaissance of the country where the battle is to be fought is needed its fields its mountains its rivers its bridges its trees its flowers its atmosphere all require and repay attentive observation from a special point of view one is quite astonished to find how many things there are in the landscape and in every object in it one never noticed before and this is a tremendous new pleasure and interest which invests every walk or drive with an added object so many colors on the hillside each different in shadow and in sunlight such brilliant reflections in the pool each a key lower than what they repeat 
such lovely lights gilding or silvering surface or outline all tinted exquisitely with pale color rose orange green or violet and i had lived for over forty years without ever noticing any of them except in a general way as one might look at a crowd and say what a lot of people i think this heightened sense of observation of nature is one of the chief delights that have come to me through trying to paint no doubt many people who are lovers of art have acquired it in a high degree without actually practicing but i expect that nothing will make one observe more quickly or more thoroughly than having to face the difficulty of representing the thing observed and mind you if you do observe accurately and with refinement and if you do record what you have seen with tolerable correspondence the result follows on the canvas with startling obedience even if only four or five main features are seized and truly recorded these by themselves will carry a lot of ill success or half success answer five big questions in the examination paper correctly and well and though you may not win a prize at any rate you won't be absolutely plowed but in order to make his plan the general must not only reconnoiter the battleground he must also study the achievements of the great captains of the past he must bring the observations he has collected in the field into comparison with the treatment of similar incidents by famous chiefs then the galleries of europe take on a new and to me at least a severely practical interest this then is how dash painted a cataract exactly and there is that same light i noticed last week in the waterfall at dash and so on you see the difficulty that baffled you yesterday and you see how easily it has been overcome by a great or even a skillful painter not only is your observation of nature sensibly improved and developed but you look at the masterpieces of art with an analyzing and a comprehending eye the whole world is open with all its treasures the simplest objects have their beauty every garden presents innumerable fascinating problems every land every parish has its own tale to tell and there are many lands differing from each other in countless ways and each presenting delicious variants of color light form and definition obviously then armed with a paint box one cannot be bored one cannot be left at a loose end one cannot have several days on one's hands good gracious what there is to admire and how little time there is to see it in for the first time one begins to envy methuselah no doubt he made a very indifferent use of his opportunities but it is in the use and withholding of their reserves that the great commanders have generally excelled after all when once the last reserve has been thrown in, the commander's part is played. If that does not win the battle, he has nothing else to give. The event must be left to luck and to the fighting troops. But these last, in the absence of high direction, are apt to get into sad confusion, all mixed together in a nasty mess, without order or plan, and consequently without effect mere masses count no more the largest brush the brightest colors cannot even make an impression the battlefield becomes a sea of mud mercifully veiled by the fog of war it is evident there has been a serious defeat even though the general plunges in himself and emerges bespattered as he sometimes does he will not retrieve the day in painting the reserves consist in proportion or relation and it is here that the art of the painter marches along the road which is traversed by all the greatest harmonies in thought at one side of the palette there is white at the other black and neither is ever used 
neat between these two rigid limits all the action must lie all the power required must be generated black and white themselves placed in juxtaposition make no great impression and yet they are the most that you can do in pure contrast it is wonderful after one has tried and failed often to see how easily and surely the true artist is able to produce every effect of light and shade of sunshine and shadow of distance or nearness simply by expressing justly the relations between the different planes and surfaces with which he is dealing we think that this is founded upon a sense of proportion trained no doubt by practice but which in its essence is a frigid manifestation of mental power and size we think that the same mind's eye that can justly survey and appraise and prescribe beforehand the values of a truly great picture in one all-embracing regard in one flash of simultaneous and homogeneous comprehension would also with a certain acquaintance with the special technique be able to pronounce with sureness upon any other high activity of the human intellect this was certainly true of the great italians i have written in this way to try to show how varied are the delights which may be gained by those who enter hopefully and thoughtfully upon the pathway of painting how enriched they will be in their daily vision how fortified in their independence how happy in their leisure whether you feel that your soul is pleased by the conception or contemplation of harmonies or that your mind is stimulated by the aspect of magnificent problems or whether you are content to find it fun to try to observe and depict the jolly things you see the vistas of possibility are limited only by the shortness of life every day you make progress every step may be fruitful yet there will stretch out before you an ever lengthening ever ascending ever improving path you know you will never get to the end of the journey but this so far from discouraging only adds to the joy and glory of the climb try it then before it is too late and before you mock at me try it while there is time to overcome the preliminary difficulties learn enough of the language in your prime to open this new literature to your age plant a garden in which you can sit when digging days are done it may be only a small garden but you will see it grow year by year it will bloom and ripen year by year it will be better cultivated the weeds will be cast out the fruit trees will be pruned and trained the flowers will bloom in more beautiful combinations there will be sunshine there even in the winter time and cool shade and the play of shadow on the pathway in the shining days of june end of painting as a pastime part one by the right honorable winston churchill from the strand magazine volume 62 december 1921 Pages 535 to 554, read by Sue Anderson. Painting as a Pastime, Part 2, by the Right Honorable Winston Churchill, from the Strand Magazine, Volume 63, January 1922, pages 13 to 20. I must say, I like bright colors i agree with ruskin in his denunciation of that school of painting who quote eat slate pencil and chalk and assure everybody that they are nicer and purer than strawberries and plums end quote i cannot pretend to feel impartial about the colors i rejoice with the brilliant ones and am genuinely sorry for the poor browns when I get to heaven, I mean to spend a considerable portion of my first million years in painting, and so get to the bottom of the subject. 
but then I shall require a still gayer palate than I get here below. I expect orange and vermilion will be the darkest, dullest colors upon it, and beyond them there will be a whole range of wonderful new colors which will delight the celestial eye. Chance led me one autumn to a secluded nook on the Côte d'Azur between Marseille and Toulon, and there I fell in with one or two painters who reveled in the methods of the modern French school. These were disciples of Cézanne. They view nature as a mass of shimmering light in which forms and surfaces are comparatively unimportant, indeed hardly visible, but which gleams and glows with beautiful harmonies and contrasts of color. Certainly it was of great interest to me to come suddenly in contact with this entirely different way of looking at things. I had hitherto painted the sea flat, with long, smooth strokes of mixed pigment, in which the tints varied only by gradations. Now I must try to represent it by innumerable, small, separate, lozenge-shaped points and patches of color, often pure color, so that it looked more like a tessellated pavement than a marine picture. It sounds curious. All the same, do not be in a hurry to reject the method. Go back a few yards and survey the result. Each of these little points of color is now playing his part in the general effect. Individually invisible, he sets up a strong radiation of which the eye is conscious without detecting the cause. Look also at the blue of the Mediterranean. How can you depict and record it? Certainly not by any single color that was ever manufactured. The only way in which that luminous intensity of blue can be simulated is by this multitude of tiny points of varied color, all in true relation to the rest of the scheme. Difficult? Fascinating. Nature presents itself to the eye through the agency of these individual points of light, each of which sets up the vibrations peculiar to its color. The brilliancy of a picture must, therefore, depend partly upon the frequency with which these points are found on any given area of the canvas, and partly on their just relation to one another. Ruskin says in his Elements of Drawing, from which I have already quoted, you will not, in Turner's largest oil pictures, perhaps six or seven feet long by four or five feet high, find one spot of color as large as a grain of wheat ungradated. But the gradations of Turner differ from those of the modern French school by being gently and almost imperceptibly evolved one from another instead of being boldly and even roughly separated. And the brush of Turner followed the form of the objects he depicted, while our French friends often seem to take a pride in directly opposing it. For instance, they would prefer to paint a sea with up and down strokes rather than with horizontal, or a tree trunk from right to left rather than up and down. This, I expect, is due to falling in love with one's theories and making sacrifices of truth to them in order to demonstrate fidelity and admiration. But surely we owe a debt to those who have so wonderfully vivified, brightened, and illuminated modern landscape painting. Have not Manet and Monet, Cézanne and Matisse rendered to painting something of the same service which Keats and Shelley gave to poetry after the solemn and ceremonious literary perfections of the 18th century. They have brought back to the pictorial art a new draft of joie de vivre, and the beauty of their work is instinct with gaiety and floats in sparkling air. I do not expect these masters would particularly appreciate my defense but I must avow an increasing attraction to their work. 
lucid and exact expression is one of the first characteristics of the french mind the french language has been made the instrument of that admirable gift frenchmen talk and write just as well about painting as they have done about love about war about diplomacy or we may add cooking their terminology is precise and complete they are therefore admirably equipped to be teachers in the theory of any of these arts their critical faculty is so powerfully developed that it is perhaps some restraint upon achievement but it is a wonderful corrective to others as well as to themselves my french friend for instance after looking at some of my daubs took me round the galleries of paris pausing here and there wherever he paused i found myself before a picture which i particularly admired he then explained that it was quite easy to tell from the kind of things i had been trying to do what were the things i liked never having taken any interest in pictures till i tried to paint i had no preconceived opinions i just felt for reasons i could not fathom that i liked some much more than others i was astonished that anyone else should on the most cursory observation of my work be able so surely to divine a taste which i had never consciously formed my friend says that it is not a bad thing to know nothing at all about pictures but to have a matured mind trained in other things and a new strong interest for painting the elements are there from which a true taste in art can be formed with time and guidance and there are no obstacles or imperfect conceptions in the way i hope this is true certainly the last part is true once you begin to study it all nature is equally interesting and equally charged with beauty i was shown a picture by cezanne of a blank wall of a house which he had made instinct with the most delicate lights and colors now i often amuse myself when i am looking at a wall or a flat surface of any kind by trying to distinguish all the different colors and tints which can be discerned upon it and considering whether these arise from reflections or from natural hue you would be astonished the first time you tried this to see how many and what beautiful colors there are even in the most commonplace objects and the more carefully and frequently you look the more variations do you perceive but these are no reasons for limiting oneself to the plainest and most ordinary objects and scenes mere prettiness of scene to be sure is not needed for a beautiful picture in fact artificially made pretty places are very often a hindrance to a good picture nature will hardly stand a double process of beautification one layer of idealism on top of another is too much of a good thing but a vivid scene a brilliant atmosphere novel and charming lights impressive contrasts if they strike the eye all at once arouse an interest and an ardor which will certainly be reflected in the work which you try to do and will make it seem easier it would be interesting if some real authority investigated carefully the part which memory plays in painting we look at the object with an intent regard then at the palette and thirdly at the canvas the canvas receives a message dispatched usually a few seconds before from the natural object but it has come through a post office en route it has been transmitted in code it has been turned from light into paint it reaches the canvas a cryptogram not until it has been placed in its correct relation to everything else that is on the canvas 
or that has yet to be put upon the canvas, can it be deciphered, is its meaning apparent, is it translated once again from mere pigment into light. And the light this time is not of nature, but of art. The whole of this considerable process is carried through on the wings, or the wheels, of memory. In most cases we think it is the wings, airy and quick like a butterfly, from flower to flower. But all heavy traffic and all that has to go a long journey must travel on wheels. In painting in the open air, the sequence of actions is so rapid that the process of translation into and out of pigment may seem to be unconscious. But all great landscapes have been painted indoors, and often long after the first impressions were gathered. In a dim cellar, the Dutch or Italian master recreated the gleaming ice of a Netherlands carnival, or the lustrous sunshine of Venice, or the Campania. Here, then, is required a truly formidable memory of the ocular kind. Not only do we develop our powers of observation, but also those of carrying the record, of carrying it through an extraneous medium, and of reproducing it hours, days, or even months after the scene has vanished, or the sunlight died. I was told by a friend that when Whistler guided a school in Paris, he made his pupils observe their model on the ground floor, and then run upstairs and paint their picture piece by piece on the floor above. As they became more proficient, he put their easels up a story higher, till at last the elite were scampering with their decision up six flights into the attic, praying it would not evaporate on the way. This is perhaps only a tale, but it shows effectively of what enormous importance a trained, accurate, retentive memory must be to an artist, and conversely, what a useful exercise painting may be for the development of an accurate and retentive memory. There is no better exercise for the would-be artist than to study and devour a picture, and then, without looking at it again, to attempt the next day to reproduce it. Nothing can more exactly measure the progress both of observation and memory it is still harder to compose out of many separate, well-retained impressions, aided though they may be by sketches and color notes, a new, complete conception. But this is the only way in which great landscapes have been painted, or can be painted. The size of the canvas alone precludes its being handled out of doors. The fleeting light imposes a rigid time limit. One cannot go back day after day without the picture getting stale. The painter must choose between a rapid impression, fresh and warm and living, but probably deserving only of a short life, and the cold, profound, intense effort of memory, knowledge, and willpower, prolonged perhaps for weeks, from which a masterpiece can alone result. It is much better not to fret too much about the latter. Leave to the masters of art trained by a lifetime of devotion the wonderful process of picture building and picture creation. Go out into the sunlight and be happy with what you see. Painting is complete as a distraction. I know of nothing which, without exhausting the body, more entirely absorbs the mind. Whatever the worries of the hour or the threats of the future, once the picture has begun to flow along, there is no room for them in the mental screen. They pass out into shadow and darkness. All one's mental light, such as it is, is concentrated on the task. 
time stands respectfully aside and it is only after many hesitations that luncheon knocks gruffly at the door when i have had to stand up on parade or even i regret to say in church for half an hour at a time i have always felt that the erect position is not natural to man has only been painfully acquired and is only with fatigue and difficulty maintained but no one who is fond of painting finds the slightest inconvenience in standing to paint for three or four hours at a time or for seven or eight hours in a day not at least as long as the interest holds lastly let me say a word on painting as a spur to travel there is really nothing like it every country where the sun shines and every district in it has a theme of its own the lights the atmosphere the aspect the spirit are all different but each has its native charm even if you are only a poor painter you can feel the influence of the scene guiding your brush selecting the tubes you squeeze onto the palette even if you cannot portray it as you see it you feel it you know it and you admire it forever when people rush about Europe in the train from one glittering center of work or pleasure into another, passing at enormous expense through a series of mammoth hotels and blatant carnivals, they little know what they are missing and how cheaply priceless things can be obtained. The painter wanders and loiters contentedly from place to place always on the lookout for some brilliant butterfly of a picture which can be caught and set up and carried safely home all he asks for is sunshine and if it be really true that we are to have thirty-five years of drought there ought to be no difficulty about supplying that cote d'azur cote d'argent cote d'emroud all present to them their world-famed beauties which neither crowds nor casinos are needed to enhance. Sir William Orpin advised me to visit Envignon on account of its wonderful light, and certainly there is no more delightful center for a would-be painter's activities. Then Egypt, fierce and brilliant, presenting in infinite variety the single triplex theme of the Nile, the desert, and the sun, or Palestine, a land of rare beauty, the beauty of the turquoise and the opal, which well deserves the attention of some real artist, and has never been portrayed to the extent that is its due. And what of India? Who has ever interpreted its lurid splendors? But after all, if only the sun will shine, one does not need to go beyond one's own country. There is nothing more intense than the burnished steel and gold of a highland stream, and at the beginning and close of almost every day the Thames displays to the citizens of London glories and delights which one must travel far to rival. I end where I began. I hope sincerely that these notes and sketches may encourage others to find out whether they have not got within them that love of color and faculty of observation which will enable them to enrich their leisure with the delightful amusement of painting. At any rate, I shall dwell in the comfortable expectation of stirring some slumbering genius into action, or at least of investing a modest life with a new sense of fullness, security, and independence and of painting as a pastime part two by the right honorable winston churchill from the strand magazine volume 63 january 1922 pages 13 to 20 read by sue anderson